I should start. Um, I'm, I'm happy that uh, we have a, a good attendance today. Obviously, we have a different time, different day, but rain especially is a major problem or major conflict at this point. Um, but it's, uh, it's great because we have a, a great speaker today. A, a really, really, a real pleasure to introduce uh, Eric Horowitz here um, from, uh, from Microsoft uh, Research Lab, as you can see. Um, so, uh, Eric has been uh, a, a site, has a lot of sites in Stanford. We had actually a meeting with a few of the faculty before, and it seemed like we basically know everybody here. And there's a great history between uh, uh, Eric and, and Stanford. He graduated from Stanford with an MP first and a PhD afterwards. Uh, it was interesting in the brain then, and as you can imagine, it's still very interesting in the brain. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see exactly what is what is uh, going to cover in this talk. But he has been now at, at Microsoft for 25 years uh, in various roles. So obviously now he's the director of the research lab there, and um, um, he has uh, uh, responsibility across a, a, a very broad range of, of activities. And he will give us a few examples. Um, there are a couple of things also that I want to mention. Is uh, as, as a, uh, history with uh, a number of faculty here, but um, interestingly, few years ago, or actually two years ago, uh, with Russ Altman, they started a, a project on uh, um, the, 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 the name is actually 100 year study of a on AI. So, in some sense, it's a sort of a very, very long range uh, look at AI in the, in the next 100 years. I, I hope he's going to mention a little bit about that. And uh, the, the list of uh, um, Awards and recognition that he's received is, is uh, enormous, so there is no way of, of going through it. Uh, but I would recommend you to actually look at his website. Um, the, the list of publications is, uh, is impressive on one end, but there are a number of nuggets. Uh, you can definitely download the, the uh, a Senate hearing that he was part of a couple of years ago, which is a really interesting read. And also a number of additional interesting papers, including one that has to do with uh, understanding how to caption cartoons. So how to write the caption for a, for a uh, comic cartoon automatically using the eye, which I thought was a really interesting <laughs> thing. So hey. without further ado, uh, Eric. Thank well, thanks very much. Um, it's always a pleasure to come back to Stanford. And, and it looks like uh, folks really went, went all out with making the weather comfortable for me, uh, being a Seattleite. So I thought today I would talk about AI and go back to the foundations of AI. And the definition I like is that artificial intelligence is the study of computational mechanisms underlying thought and intelligent behavior. And the founders in 19, 1955, uh, if we can lower the audio a little bit so it's a little bit loud, um, they actually uh, pointed out in the proposal, they were really trying to find how to make machines solve the kinds of problems now reserved for humans, as another definition uh, in those days. And back in 1956, in the proposal, they, they, they called out perception, learning, reasoning, and natural language as four pillars of investigation. Calling out natural language is something very special uh, for human intellect. Uh, one thing I think it's important to point out is uh, perceptions versus the reality, especially in this time of, of hyperbole about AI and AI advances, is that while we tend to think about the, the, uh, these moments in news stories like Watson or AlphaGo uh, or a self-driving car, in reality, there's been an ongoing um, uh, long-term um, inclined plane of advances. And one example I'd like to point out is like in the late 90s, a really great piece of work uh, at a SUNY Buffalo by Venu Govindaraju and his, and his uh, team to create a pipeline to look at handwriting recognition uh, with a language model. Uh, this, this was pressed into service worldwide for, for looking at handwritten envelopes and routing letters. Uh, there's many projects like this, AI projects that are running beneath the hood of our society. Um, speaking of beneath the hood, about a decade ago, my team, working with the Windows team, built a decision theoretic machine learning, machine learning based prefetcher running in Windows that's always guessing what you're going to do next. And it's pre-computing, prefetching, so your old machine seems much faster now. And that's been running for years now. That's core AI running in an operating system. So just in general, uh, a lot's been going on over, over the years. 
um, not just the recent uh, uh, events. But that said, there has been an inflection point around 2009 at Microsoft Research. We, had, we hosted Jeff Hinton and, and some others. Uh, and we rediscovered uh, this, the power of neural networks, convolutional neural networks back then with speech data and discovered, I, the way I'd put it is we discovered that these methods which were well understood, well, I shouldn't say well understood because even today we don't understand them, but they were uh, well-known entities in the, in the late 80s and early 90s, and they didn't perform as well as some of the other machine learning methods. And we discovered they were simply famished for data all those years. And we, when we came back and, and applied a large quantity of speech data, saw a surprising dip in word error recognition rates for a data set called Switchboard. And now, to this day, we've, we've actually um, uh, gone down for that data set to superhuman levels beyond professional transcription uh, of this kind of data. The same methods uh, have been applied to object recognition. Uh, ResNet was a world uh, leading um, solution to um, the ImageNet challenge. Uh, and then more recently, many other applications, including um, a reading challenge at a Stanford called the Squad Challenge that Microsoft Research uh, tied up with Alibaba on in terms of uh, answering questions uh, to, um, about Wikipedia stories. That was that kind of test set, and that continues now. And advances are continuing. For example, we haven't really seen a lot of applications yet but, uh, in, in, the, in the wild, but we're now recognizing activities in video scenes, and that will become, you can imagine, a suite of services. Now, speaking of, of, of services, the idea of pressing these advances into practice uh, is a reality uh, at, at, at major IT centers and other, other um, in academia. Uh, for example, Office 365 uh, uses this analytical pipeline um, involving object recognition with vision as well as a natural language analysis to do automatic captioning of photos that you pop into PowerPoint, for example. And uh, Skype Translator um, does speech-to-speech -speech translation. And just a few years ago, this was like a, 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 a far-out project in our lab. Can we make a speech-to-speech -speech translator of the kind that Captain Kirk would use on a distant planet? And now we consider this commonplace. It's no big deal. Google does it, Microsoft does it. But the fact that it's sitting in Skype now, and then we get into, into high stakes areas uh, like my daily drive to work. I think I, I overuse the Tesla autopilot. I, I think I'm, I, I, I explain that by I'm testing it as an AI researcher. Um, but the fact that we, we're seeing these convolutional neural networks by report being used to now recognize road markings and steering a car, interesting. And along with this also comes now tools. So Microsoft and other companies now are, are sort of putting in the cloud and making programming tools that let anybody weave into their applications various kinds of, of recognition features, for example, recognizing faces, expression, emotion, um, uh, age, uh, gender, and so on. And along with that comes um, platforms and programs running in the cloud, in this case, Azure Machine Learning, uh, that lets, for example, one of the demonstrations is how to take a, a, a large NIH data set of of chest x-rays and show how to predict pneumonia up to the par or level that we see in research centers now. This is as a, now a, a tool that anybody can do. You can do this yourself. Uh, and what I have here on the right side here is a graphic that shows we actually are doing pedal to the metal now in terms of providing special F FPGA technologies that really run uh, deep nets very, very quickly uh, by doing special hardware. And we can start dreaming about multiple applications where we can apply predictive technologies more generally. Now, what I want to point out is that typically these days we think about pattern recognition and mostly about classifiers and predictive models. Um, people often say we have some sense data or some large corpora of data. We want to do some predictions. That will give us a probability distribution. But the rubber meets the road with decisions. And I like to look at this arrow, this uh, I feel like my, the golden arrow of data to predictions to decisions, and thinking deeply about not just probability distributions, but actions in the world, decisions, preference models. And the, much more needs to be done about this, and also about thinking about the larger system where you have 
human users of the output of these systems and designing solutions that really keep in mind that it's not just about automation or about a classifier. It's about a, a, a complex work environment, for example, with where many decisions have to be made. As an example, uh, here's some work uh, that I and some colleagues, including uh, Mohsen Bayati, who's here at Stanford now in the business school, worked on several years ago, of a shipping product uh, called Readmissions Manager that actually looks at many, very many variables in electronic health records and puts up a score, the probability that a patient will bounce back or be readmitted to a hospital within 30 days, which is actually tracked by the Medicare services. Um, we'll get back to that in a, in a few minutes and thinking about, about the issues about how you apply these kinds of models in decision making. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the, the, the power of these methods for assisting in various ways with science. Um, this is some work um, that, that uh, really is one of the salient pieces of work that I, that, I, that I think about when I think about will AI transform how science is done. And a team led by Sarah Jane Dunn at our Cambridge lab in, in uh, England um, looked at, at uh, expression data, the sort of protein expression data coming out of cells as they transition from stem cell to a final tissue type. Uh, and by applying Z3, a theorem prover, a logical theorem prover to do satisfaction, um, discovered that cells were locked into place with, a, with just three inputs, just three signals, cutting through all this complexity to know that as a cell transitions into, let's say, skin or a neuron in your brain, it's a, there's a, a, this, just all you needed was to unlock that and lock those cells was three inputs. It came out of cutting through complexity with a the theorem prover. But today I wanted to pause and talk about aspirations, given where we are moving forward in AI and, and have you think with me about possibilities. We built a new lab called Microsoft Research AI um, about a year and a half ago, uh, taking a lot of our AI folks in our Redmond lab, uh, this is like this, the main lab where Microsoft began, our Starship lab, we call it, um, and built a separate um, AI lab and thought about five aspirations. I'm gonna mention three of them right now to you and talk a little bit about them. First aspiration is attain more general intelligence. I'm not really, a big, I'm not really fond of the term art, artificial general intelligence. You might hear that thrown around, AGI, because I think this is a very, we're in a big multi-dimensional space and we're on an inclined plane of competency. So I always say towards more general, and more about that in a minute. We like to also master human AI collaboration. This is a critical, low-hanging area where we can do lots of interesting work. And then address opportunities and challenges with AI people and society, another really rich area. Let's start with attaining more general intelligence. Um, if you think about it, I would, I, my, my, my sense is that the founders of the field would be quite disappointed if you, we told them, hey, it's 2018, almost 2020, here's what we have. They go, wow, we thought we'd have that in the 70s. What's, what's taking so long? Why haven't you made progress? It'd be disappointment. In many ways, what we've managed to accomplish is we were very good at building narrow wedges of competency almost like, we'll call them savants, you know, brilliant but narrow systems. We haven't really cracked what I would call the, the deep mysteries of human intellect, including our ability to do many things, to generalize across tasks, our ability to learn in the wild in an unsupervised way, our massive store that we seem to manipulate with ease uh, of common sense, social common sense, physical common sense, um, we haven't really scratched the surface in many ways, um, yet we are celebrating our ability to do better pattern recognition. And we're applying that left, right, and central right now. Uh, and so this idea of, of doing more, and what, what are some interesting directions? And I, we have a whole bunch of directions we're trying to pursue this in, and as is our, our colleagues in the AI community. And I'll mention a few right now. One is we need to address data scarcity. If you think about the celebration of a game of perfect information, like our ability to win at the best, ex to beat the best experts at Go, or chess, or checkers, um, these systems have the ability to play themselves a trillion times and generate data in a reinforcement learning setting, and take that data and learn from it. But in the real world, we're in, a, in this big data era, we're literally, for things we really care about, mostly in an era of data scarcity. 
when it comes to that kind of data. And so one approach is let's start going into, into richer stimulation. And you know, I see me, we heard about it a little bit with the, at, the, at the faculty roundtable. Simulation is, central, is a central theme or pillar in, in ICME, you know, much work in this field. But it's becoming a hot area in AI right now. Can we build realistic simulators? This is called AirSim, we built at Microsoft Research. Um, and this is for testing cars and other kinds of uh, flying machines. But it captures physics, you know, magnetic field, climate, uh, atmosphere. Um, fluid dynamics. But the nice thing about this is we can actually, we know our sensors quite well that sit in our drones, for example. We can model them perfectly. And by the way, we also know ground truth in simulators, like what's really out there. And so we can literally begin doing things like collect large amounts of data, for example, as that drone flies through this world, and train up a deep neural network, for example. So this case, for example, we looked at taking binocular camera in that world, uh, or going to a monocular camera and training up the ability to see depth um, with a monocular view by knowing, automatically labeling the data, because we know distances to various things in front of the system here, and then showing how we can run that system uh, with this learned model. You can imagine also doing reinforcement learning in this world. We're working actually with a, with a major car manufacturer. I won't tell you who exactly right now. But you can imagine you don't want to live in one of these houses uh, at the early phases of a reinforcement learning regime. Um, a system is really just doing explore, exploit, trying to learn how to drive itself around. You don't want to be living in that house down the street there by any means. <laughs> Um, but after a while, the system starts learning to do quite well, but, it, but we, we actually removed the, the, <laughs> we removed the graphics loop so it can run much faster, you can imagine, and we wouldn't wait around to necessarily render this for people to watch. But think about this interesting application here, building a system that is trained in simulation to go up to northern Saskatchewan province and to inspect power lines, not get too close to them, but be close enough to inspect them with care trained in simulation, for example. It's a great, really great, great direction. Another direction is this idea of thinking more deeply about physics, even more than you saw in that simulator. But by putting physics into deep learning uh, within a layer, uh, uh, within the deep learning cycle and, deep, and, the re and the deep inference cycle. So the idea is to imagine we have a, basically a graphics engine sitting as part of a deep learning pipeline. And think about this for like, let's say for faces. The idea is if we actually figure out how to separate out um, lighting models from shape and understand how heads typically rotate, um, you can expand the data set and create a data set that's much more general and understands more about the, that intrinsically is knowledgeable, knowledgeable about the world by understanding how lighting affects data, affects a view. And, build a much more robust system than just a system that only recognizes the faces that it saw head on, for example. And a final area that I'll mention we call integrative AI. Everybody sitting in this room right now probably feels, well, maybe most of you, like you're a singular entity, singular intellect with a fluid experience, fluid intellect that's singular and coordinated. But psychologists will tell us typically that it's probably the case that where uh, a large number of competencies that somehow is joined together by some mysterious coordination. We can do many things we can, we, uh, at, at all times here. Boy, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, and um, so with this area called integrative AI, um, the idea is to, to take the best of, of breed in our machine learning, inferential, and planning technologies, um, and, and machine vision and speech recognition, and start to weave these things together with various kinds of special case libraries of common sense uh, to build uh, new kinds of experiences that really leverage uh, this idea of what I like to refer to as a symphony of intellect by, that we coordinate well. This to me is a really promising direction. Um, if you look at our, come to our web pages, look at some of the papers we've written, you'll see how we've, been, we've, we've built systems. For example, this assistant by my door at Microsoft and a receptionist that have been done 
as projects explicitly to explore integrative AI, the, the power and possibilities here. Um, and, you know, is it, an example is, again, the assistant will, can, can see, can hear, um, can recognize who, uh, with vision whether there's engagement or not. Let's, let's listen in for a second for how the system works. Maybe we'll hear a little bit about it. It's a little bit low. I was thinking if I can get quickly get, get access to a volume, but it's okay. So it's, it's, it's not that important. It's not that let's let it go. So what, what's happening is this person, this, this agent is actually looking, and she actually is using her vision to communicate, but she can't see well. She's asking people to separate. She's um, uh, engaging about my calendar and so on. Um, she also is getting confused here, and she's just demonstrating her confusion when people look away at the wrong time. Um, making these, these systems more human-like and more natural in their emotion, their ability to recover from error over time. Um, and also uh, using the same tools, this is called the Psy Toolkit, which is now on, we're sharing out on GitHub. Um, also handles robotics, uh, again, allowing this kind of a weave of motion planning and uh, vision, natural language, and showing the magic of the symphony of intellect. By the way, the, one of these projects we're looking at right now is the, the, is the coordination itself, uh, looking at an area called contextual bandits to automatically learn how to coordinate uh, and to optimize how resources flow among many components, all hungry for the CPU, for example, and network and so on. The second area I want to mention is mastering human AI collaboration. And um, there are several dimensions of this. Um, First of all, there are some new perceptual abilities we're giving our systems to work better with people. And we want to actually model this idea of complementarity between humans and machines. So on the perceptual side, um, it looks like a cartoon of sorts, but uh, it's impressive. This is our Cambridge lab in the UK. Again, what our teams have done, the, the ability at a distance to recognize the pose of a hand in a fluid manner. Um, I have to tell my team that if you can recognize with fluidity, thumb and forefinger, we can build civilizations. Now imagine a system that can engage at a distance and know your, what your hand is doing, um, what you might do with that, how you might mesh this, for example, with HoloLens someday, and so on. But I'm actually very excited about complementarity. Um, you know, all of us are different in different ways. But we're also quite different than machines. And as an example of of a basic direction. I want to talk to you a little bit about this Chameleon Grand Challenge about two and a half years ago, which provided a set of, of pathology slides as part of the challenge, uh, or images as part of the challenge problem. Uh, and the goal was, can I find metastatic breast cancer cells in slices of lymph node tissue, which is a really important challenge in healthcare. Well, it turned out, to the glee, I would imagine, of pathologists, human pathologists, the best machine learning algorithm, which was actually a deep network, was not as good as the humans. So it's a brief respite. We can sort of like, OK, we, we're still ahead there. But, but it turned out that the, the, er, the types of false positives and false negatives of humans, which lead to a 3.4% error, and the pattern in machines are different. So even a simple combination of the machine and the, um, and the human led to an 85% reduction in human errors, a simple combination. So you see a direction here. Now, more generally, we can imagine using machine learning and reasoning itself to figure out what is the complementarity between the machine and the human. And it can be quite dynamic, and it can depend on the human being. So several years ago, AJ Kumar and I looked at it with a project, looked at this, this, this this, uh, this data set that was using human beings to tag galaxies to help with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which had too many galaxies to look at by experts. And so citizen scientists were being, were being employed to vote and so on. And it turned out with, with, with a combination of what's called Monte Carlo tree search and machine learning, we built a system that understands how to combine machine vision with human intellect and we showed how we can, for half the human effort, get this, just about the same accuracy. This shows an example of this, this kind of complementarity that we learn about, again, uh, with, with, with machine learning itself. 
But the future, I think, is, is actually bright. And here's some open problems that we found um, that I hope some of you will work on. And it, this involves you know, gaining access and, 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 and establishing collaborations with cognitive psychologists. But this is like kind of a dream, uh, a dream uh, image I have. Here's human intellect, it's this blob. And on the vertical axis is the abilities, more as we go up. And we know from uh, over 100 years of cognitive psychology results that human beings have certain blind spots and biases and gaps in their abilities across all of us. We're all different in our own ways. And the dream sequence is, can we build machine intellect to understand intrinsically and deeply, not in a basic way, but deeply those gaps and where the machines can fill in. And our team has looked at the interesting areas of memory, attention, and judgment, which are actually are pillars of cog psych. Um, you know, that, that we're in a cognitive psychology department, you'll have people uh, that, that specialize in these different areas of, of psychology. And some people might be familiar with Tversky and Kahneman's work in the whole larger area of judgment and decision making and the various biases that have been found in our ability, that are regular biases that you can, almost like illusions of judgment um, across people. Um, but work in psychology goes beyond that. For example, the work of Sperling and Melchner back in the 70s was looking at characterizing the ability of human beings to do two tasks at once and generating these attention operating characteristic curves. And how can we apply those? How can a machine understand these in a way to help someone drive a car better, for example, to understand the, 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 what, 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 the, what the load is on people and their abilities to respond and multitask? And over the years at Microsoft, we've had several projects looking at attention, memory, and judgment with, with different projects. Um, and these all have been uh, in pursuit of ways to better build complementary machines over time. So for example, uh, we're very interested in this idea of forgetting and reminding. You know, how can we figure out, uh, in this case machine learning, to learn about things you might forget and want to know about in context? Cortana has a system right now in place that we, we, we fielded and that we're refining all the time that tries to look at your email and it figures out um, when you've made a promise to somebody, a commitment to somebody that you might not have kept, uh, you might be forgetting about. So how many people here have, uh, can you see this here? How many people have, have gotten this, have said, oh my gosh, I told you I'd do this like three days ago. Raise your hand. That came out of my email and Cortana reminded me, he says, you know, send these people <laughs> your title and abstract. Um, but but the, how do you get this right is a really important question. And we've built models, including a system we published in Amas a few years back called Jogger that had three different models. It predicted what you're likely to forget, when you'd like to remember it, and if it's important to remember it in context, and the cost of interrupting you at any moment. And so you have to run all three of these models at once and do a really great job to build a great reminder system that would be loved and adored and desired in different settings. Getting more serious, we want to think about this interesting other gap. Uh, how do we understand what errors people make potentially in high stakes situations? So for example, could we build a model uh, of this form uh, with some colleagues here that, that actually predicts that an expert emergency room physician will be surprised by an outcome. And here's the data set. The data set is um, patients that are discharged uh, from an emergency room uh, that come back within 48 hours that are, in, that are then admitted to the hospital with a serious problem that was nowhere on the chart when they were discharged. They call that a a human surprise. Now imagine a system that's running in real time that predicts that someone is going to come back within, within 48 hours that's being let go, and the system telling a physician, hey, I know you're an expert, but I've been trained on data from 15 years of electronic health records that predicts just those surprises that might hide in your cognitive shadows. You want to look, what I, look and see what I'm thinking? I think most physicians would like to look at this. Now, I think you might consider the fact that the third most common death in the United States, probably in the world, uh, as reported in a journal article a few years ago, uh, is medical error. A city the size of, if you believe this British Medical Journal estimation of, of deaths due to medical error, a city the size of Oakland or Miami 
is disappearing every year because of human errors in hospitals in the United States. And this happens without any headlines or front page news stories. Can we build AI systems that are kind of like the, the safety nets under the bridge workers at the Golden Gate Bridge and catch them just when we need to catch them as complementary to their own minds, to their cognition? Here's some recent work I'm doing with a student at University of Washington on this interesting phrase called failure to rescue. What does that mean? It came out of the late 90s. It, it's basically a patient will tip uh, in a hospital um, and no one recognizes that they're tipping with an organ system failure, for example, that leads to a cascade to death. Now imagine that, what, what, the, what the data set would look like to find patients in this case who are um, patients who come in uh, for an optional procedure that end up not coming out of the hospital and looking at when did they tip. And building systems that can actually identify, can predict that a life-saving maneuver will be done, might need to be done within 12 hours, eight hours, four hours to help alert physicians to the notion of they might be in a, in a failing to rescue situation. I want to just basically now end by talking a little bit about opportunities and challenges with AI people in society. There's so much opportunity here, and I always think, I'm such an optimist, I always think about what we can do to solve major problems uh, that challenge society for decades. Like how do we handle interesting challenges in emerging markets. We have an emerging markets group in our Bangalore lab, for example, looking at education issues, health issues in, in developing countries, accessibility, uh, agriculture, and, and, and looking at sustainability. One example of a project I'll show you, is, which I think is a fun one for me, and working with Ashish Kapoor on this, is called Windflow. We recognized that uh, our, our wind models in, in the United States um, and the rest of the world are basically built by NOAA using Balloon launches, you know, every few hours, you know, in a, in a few locations in the U.S., balloons are launched and winds are tracked, used by our national wind service, our weather services, uh, our, our, um, our, our, air, our air transport system. We realized, wait a minute, we said, can we actually think about ground radar uh, and, and planes that are being tracked and use that as a source of information with graphical models to figure out what winds are? And the basic intuition here is that two planes uh, flying overhead, and by the way, this is what it looks like above our heads right now, uh, how many planes are up in the air. They're not that big, by the way, the planes. Um, but two planes flying towards each other in the same region of space are probably, if you consider spatial regularity, are, are facing the same winds at different directions. And you can tell by what the planes are doing, you can solve for missing variables to generate winds. Um, and do inferences. So we built a system. It's a true cloud service. I, I joke. Um, but if you can go to the Windflow site and get better winds per our studies and our publications than NOAA can give based on a very fine grained wind model with thousands of sensors, airplanes. And we originally had to pay for these planes, the plane data. And that was rather fun because we can do a decision theoretic analysis of the value of pinging a plane um, to collapse the uncertainty over the whole system. Um, sooner or later, we got the FAA to give us the whole pipeline. So we have the pipeline now coming into Microsoft's research. Um, the cool thing also about this is we actually can point planners. We can have a, we've built an API. That's the same API used on the NOAA service. So an aircraft company working with one major air, air transport company can point their planners at our service, at our, at our, at our graphical models, probabilistic models, as opposed to the NOAA balloon-based service. And let me just end by now talking about some of the rough edges here. So just in the last few months, these are headlines that have appeared. And maybe we can go into discussion about these topics as well. So we don't have much time to continue right now. But you know, the, we have, we've had several interesting topics that have come up. And what excites me about these challenges uh, when it comes to people in society with what I would call the rough edges of AI is this notion of it's interesting to think about AI going from the R&D environment into the open, larger world. And what that means, for me, I was always excited about the technical challenges of doing that. But in recent years, we're looking at, at ethical, legal, and societal influences and what that means. And I, the, the reason I thought to myself why we hadn't thought a lot about this in the past was we didn't have the penetration we now have of our models and systems, where any innovation we make can affect millions of people through the scaling out and the usage scale enabled by computers in our pockets worldwide and the web. It changes things a bit. Um, so 
So last year we actually sat down, we, MSR got together with our legal team at Microsoft and wrote a book together. You can read, it's, it's free to download called The Future Computed. We, we, we called out fairness, reliability, privacy and security, inclusiveness, transparency and accountability as being very important attributes we want to sort of really think deeply about in this world of machine intelligence. Um, and some open world challenges include thinking deeply about capabilities of our systems, what are their blind spots and biases, about values, including are the values of our systems aligned with our values, and who's the decision maker, whose preferences are represented in a system that might be affecting somebody else. And then misuse, human rights challenges, legal, ethical, and privacy challenges, and so on. I'll just make a comment here that this is one of my guiding principles for AI systems. I like to go back to Lao Tse, uh, who said, this is the translation from the Chinese, knowing that you do not know is the best, not knowing that you do not know is an illness. And if you think about um, our systems these days, um, uh, like let's say the Tesla, it largely handles known unknowns. It does a pretty good job uh, with reasoning under uncertainty. So if the system is in autopilot, and it encompasses a, 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 a situation where it's uncertain, it will sort of make a loud noise and, and give up and say, take over, I can't handle this. The problem is, though, um, this is a picture out of my window uh, on the way to a retreat at Microsoft uh, in, a, in a rural area where I was in autopilot and I wasn't sure how the system was going to handle this situation. I didn't know if the Fremont test track you know, included the, you know, the idea of deer in front of the car. So I took it out of autopilot, but I've had several problems, and you can read about one of my problems uh, in an article in Wired that, was, that was, uh, featured uh, my tangling with the, the autopilot. Um, but we want to actually think deeply about what's the technology behind reasoning and inference about unknown unknowns, giving our AI systems explicit knowledge that they're limited in the open world. We can do this. Um, and we can learn about blind spots and so on. So some work uh, with intern Himabindu Lakaruju, who was a Mike Stanford intern with us a couple of years ago, looked at how do we automatically work with humans and triage potential blind spots in a, in a, in a machine classifier. And more recently, working on um, discovering blind spots and reinforcement learning. These technologies are going to be very important to build robust and trustworthy AI systems in the open world. And other directions include the idea of defer the fielding of technology. We say it's not ready yet, per our the capabilities. To have phased clinical trials, clinical in quotes, standards on reporting, required studies, disclosure of risks and failures, and then fail-safe designs, like the famous, this, this whole area of fail-safe engineering that's not really part of AI tradition, like air brakes. That, uh, that, that were designed many years ago uh, that are used worldwide um, to, to create a fail-safe design. Let me, since we're running out of time, I'm going to pop past value as an agency here and um, talk about misuses. Um, we really care about human rights violations, risk of death and serious injury, and the denial of, of consequential resources and services, including um, uh, uh, issues around recommendations made for loans, uh, for education and so on. Um, I'll mention that uh, about two years ago we formed the Ether Committee at Microsoft Corporation. It stands loosely for AI Ethics and Effects in Engineering and Research. We have seven working groups. You can see them here, sensitive uses, bias and fairness, engineering practices, reliability and safety, human AI interaction and collaboration, transparency, and human attention and cognition. And there's been some news about this group. Um, for example, this article that came out uh, back in the early spring. Um, I don't know how they got this picture, but it shows that the headline is Microsoft turning down some sales <laughs> over AI ethics. Says, I guess someone thinks I'm a top researcher. Um, or this was the article about my, my, my tangle with uh, the Tesla. Uh, you can read about this, this issue here. And then recently, we actually published a blog on face recognition technology. Um, you can read about this online, where we said, this technology raises issues that go to the heart of fundamental human rights protections like privacy and freedom of expression. These issues heighten responsibility for tech companies that create these products. They also call for thoughtful government regulation. So Microsoft was calling for the government to think deeply about 
face recognition when it comes to surveillance. Um, I'll stop here, but uh, in, in discussion, we can talk about some of the decisions we've made lately that were covered or that I referred to in that, uh, that news story about turning down uh, revenues and uh, engagements over AI ethics issues. Um, and I'll, I'll just stop here and I'll, I'm going to basically just uh, uh, summarize, because we, I want to just get to discussion here, that the goal here is to pursue principles of intelligence, its core intellectual work in computer science, to master human AI collaboration, which is a, at the intersection of psychology, human factors, computer science, uh, and design. Um, we want to attend with sensitivity to AI people in society, and it, we're going to have to collaborate widely with multiple stakeholders when it comes to these challenges on the influences of AI uh, in people, for people in society. And I'll stop there. Thanks very much. What a discussion. <laughs> And I was hoping for a deep question about ethics. Eric, so, do you mind repeating the yeah. question? So the question was, how does, how does a place like, what is the experience like, let's say, thinking about careers, a place like Microsoft Research, how does it differ from being like in academia? Well, I can't comment on other IT companies, but I know that when we set up Microsoft Research, um, uh, we created it as an open research lab. Um, and I was, I was actually doing a startup, finishing up my PhD work down in California Avenue here. And Microsoft acquired our company. And I was thinking, well, I want to join this new research lab. It was brand new. And I remember asking the question, will there ever be any controls on publications? And, the, and, the, and the, the, the agreement was no. Microsoft research means a, that a researcher can publish anything they'd like without any permission. Um, so the main mission at Microsoft research is to expand the state of the art. The second mission is to, to really transfer ideas, technologies, and innovations as fast as possible into Microsoft products and services. And people want to do both. Typically, people want to really get their stuff into the world. So one difference is that a place at Microsoft, um, while you're free to, to pursue your dreams and pursue the frontiers of science, you also have this tantalizing lever hanging above you all the time with a fulcrum at the horizon. And the question is, you, can, you know, or the, 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 the opportunity is, you can move the world. You also have data sets, very large data sets, uh, and, and so on. Now, over the years, other companies, I, I, it looks like Google um, and Facebook are getting more like MSR, but still, I haven't heard that they become like Microsoft Research. And there's a longer, a longer answer about students and difference between having long-term students versus interns. And we, there's, there's many, many nuances we shouldn't get, get into. So I think both careers sound great to me. Yeah. Uh, great talk, so thank you for coming here. Um, my question is a little bit of ethics and a little bit of, uh, I guess, a technical depth to it. Um, when you describe the safety net kind of uh, vision of, of AI and healthcare, uh, I, I think that's something that's very appealing to us, but uh, to be honest, everything I've seen with at least our pattern recognition uh, technologies and what we see with self-driving cars is that most likely the AI systems will be great at the situations that occur 90% of the time and are actually pretty bad at those edge cases. Um, and as a consequence, what will likely have happened is the human operator has really nothing to do except some low-level surveillance until those edge cases happen. Like if you're driving a self-driving car, or you, you know, you're just sitting there, but you have to be there because there are situations that will arise. So I guess, how do you handle, or what, what do you think is going to happen going forward to ideally convert those roles to be better suited for what we want to do and how that will affect jobs? My first reaction is that um, you can look at the, the artifacts that we build and human beings as having operating region, re, re, uh, regions that they do well at and edge cases uh, for both. Uh, and the question is characterizing them well enough to, and, and really thinking deeply about designs that leverage both. Uh, if you have a human, human computer collaboration setting or if it's just an automated setting, 
it really comes down to being insightful about the design, how you build your system, where you place it, what the fail safes are like, uh, and so on, what the reliability signals are like, how well you do on, on even predicting reliability. I pulled out some slides, even though I already had too many slides, and I obviously did, on using deep learning itself to better characterize failures. I think we could do much better at this. I'm actually very optimistic. So um, we can't be naive about the application of these technologies up, uh, and end up in, in brittle, brittle worlds where 10% of the time we're in big trouble. That's not going to work very well. Uh, but I'm very hopeful that there are designs that actually do harness the, 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 you know, what's good about both humans and, and machines. I think that um, uh, companies like Toyota have a very different vision than, let's say, Tesla on what AI will be doing in a car. So Gil Pratt, who oversees the the, the, the Toyota AI uh, effort, and we have a, you know, there's a major investment at, my, at sorry, at Stanford here uh, as collaborators in that effort. They view the AI as always assisting quietly in the background as opposed to like being an autopilot. And think about that, the whole design paradigm. I'm not making any comments on which is better right now, but you can imagine if you start from that paradigm, it's a very different design uh, setting for thinking through creatively how we use the best of AI and how we would be robust to the whatever percent of the brittleness of the AI system. So it's a kind of a, I'm giving you a longish answer, but I think it comes down to really understanding the technology deeply and not being naive about how you apply it. Yeah. Um, how do you account for diversity in like human perception of ethics to an ethics board like um, <laughs> So the ether board is pretty diverse in general. I say it's, we, we, it's diverse in many ways. It's diverse in terms of gender as well as um, uh, um, backgrounds and in representing all of, the, all of Microsoft's divisions. Um, um, but you asked a broader question. And so one of my comments when it comes to um, uh, thinking about diversity and ethics. So ethics is a very big word. I think it's cost benefit. There's, uh, there are um, notions of norms when it comes to, for example, worldwide and country by country appreciation of human rights, what that means. Um, and so um, uh, let me just answer your question beyond talking about diversity of thinkers. Talk about preference models. If we build a system that's making some cost-benefit trade-off, and I, I actually just now, I, um, I, um, I'm not sure who's talking to who here, but I'm going to pull this out. Um, if, if, you, if you think about this idea that um, we have a medical system and at different um, operating thresholds, we have different false positives and false negative rates, at different thresholds of what we accept as a let's say a classification like this patient will be readmitted to this hospital in 30 days. How much, how high should the probability be of that being true? We accept that and take an action based on that. Well, different thresholds are different cost benefit relationships uh, and settings. And when it comes to real patients, it's not clear that their values are being represented versus like Medicare services or a hospital administrator. Or if you have two patients, they may have different preferences. So, so for the first time in history, I think, we have rich representations or the ability to re represent human preferences richly in our systems, which makes them explicit and controllable. So imagine getting into your car someday, <clears throat> your new Tesla or Ford 2027 model car. <clears throat> you can't drive it before you watch some videos and assess your preferences. What would you do in this situation? And then it's your preferences and it's your car as opposed to some co corporate utility function. Again, longish answer, but there's more to talk about here. It's like we could talk about this for an hour and a half or so. Yeah? Um, what's your opinion about human over relying on AI that, like, the example is, uh, you mentioned the reminding tool, right? So if you, it's actually might weaken your uh, ability to memorize things if you're over relying on um, Actually, Another question is like, has Microsoft done anything that uh, any research related on this, or like build a machine learning model to see like how far away AI should help people to build the future? 
Yeah, so it's interesting. Uh, Linda Boyle, <clears throat> a colleague of ours at University of Washington in transportation, studies people's loss of ability after they've been playing with good old-fashioned adaptive cruise control. You know, like not even like modern technology. You know, it's like a, put your car in sort of cruise control. It's a kind of adaptive cruise control. And then she watches people's loss of ability to break and do the right thing just from that and the, the effects in the short term and long term of these kinds of interventions. And obviously we've had all sorts of uh, technologies, the pen and paper to start with. That probably affected us, our abilities a little bit, maybe plus and minus. You, we, hear, but we hear these stories about, about sages who would tell whole oral story, you know, oral tradition in a, in, a, in, a, in a culture that didn't have written language. Oh, these very, very detailed stories were passed down for centuries. Well, did we lose that ability when people started writing booklets up and passing the booklets along? Uh, so it, it's something that we should, we should think about as a civilization. But there's so many interesting nuanced influences of technology on society. The slides that I, I blasted through very quickly, the last slides, were about um, this world we're in right now that includes everybody in this room adversarial attacks on your attention for the purpose of a company making money. How does that affect people? I think these are very important concepts to think about. What is time well spent? There's a time well spent movement. Um, the fact that, and I was, I was on, on, on the, I, I joke with my colleagues at Facebook and, and Google, uh, where we know that some people have been the best machine learning people of our, of our era, from Stanford and Berkeley and other schools, are hired to go and maximize time of engagement on a timeline and are incentivized to do that. Um, and then we as end users don't really realize that this is actually, you know, this is the, our, our attraction and interest is not just, it's algorithmic. Uh, and Microsoft is not innocent. We have gaming franchise, Halo, and so on. And so we have to all think as a community about what this will mean moving into the future when it comes to ethics of, of, of again, I'll call it adversarial attacks on our cognition and our attention. Bet you weren't expecting that answer. OK. Yeah. Uh, how does the European regulation on data, the GDPR, affect the Microsoft AI department in collecting and using user data to further yeah. <coughs> Well, GDPR, um, <clears throat> I think most <clears throat> of the reaction to GDPR <clears throat> was that it, it, it's a, a really valuable set of principles that uh, we actually at Microsoft welcomed. Um, and it was challenging because we had to go through all the, we had all these, these incredible data sets we've had that are properly anonymized and so on, but we've kept them for many years and you just can't retain data the same way, even for research purposes. So one of my concerns has been, um, <clears throat> one of my concerns has been, does GDPR have the right allowances for research such that it doesn't hold back important scientific uh, advancement? And um, I think we're doing pretty well right now with the, well, you know, we actually had to clean up everything by deadlines. And I'm sure the same, same was true of many companies uh, and universities. Um, but I just was at the um, talking in front of the European Commission in June and in, in discussions, and I brought up the fact that we can't be, you know, in pursuit of these great principles, we really should not be naive about what it might mean for science and to really create the right kind of balance. Yes? That's a really, really great question. Um, I almost feel like ending on that and talking, talking to you offline. Um, the Ether Committee typically gets requests from product teams for a review of a project, um, review of a service at Microsoft. And there's a core group that will meet from the, it's called the Sensitive Uses Working Group. 
Um, and they have a pipeline of considerations that they want everyone to be sensitive to. And one of the first blocks in that flowchart is capabilities. Is the capabilities of the, the, the machine intelligence uh, sophisticated and competent enough to do, to do well in, with this, in this high stakes situation? And if you think it does, what's the cost of the failures? What, in terms of lives, deaths, money, you know, and, and so losses. And in some places, you might say, um, it's still a better solution than today's solution without the machine, because you know, we always have to sort of compare it to what the current world is like, and then think through education, disclosure of, of the performance, um, understanding how to test with actual genuine test sets that come from the actual specific end use case and the world that might change and how do you maintain the system over time. And very often we'll just make a call that we recommend that this is not ready yet. For example, face recognition is not ready yet to be used in situations X in the open world to recognize people that would guide consequential decisions, even them being held up for a while while they're being searched uh, erroneously. So I'll stop there. Thanks, everybody. It's been fun.